Mother, how long have we been traveling? Approximately 24 days. Ash, any suggestions from you or Mother? No, we're still collecting. I've got access to Mother now, and I'll get my own answers. Thank you. You are listening to Yutani, the podcast for all things alien, AI, robotics, sci-fi, and technology. Hello, this is Clara, but you can call me Mother, and welcome to... Uh, I guess another episode of our Analyzing Alien 40 Years On. Uh, today I've got with me Connor Colson. Connor. Yep. We're going, nice we're going to be video back with here. you. Did video work on your end? Uh, uh, I'm not, well, through Skype I'm not seeing you, no. No? Okay, I don't know what's going on. We will just go with me on the screen for now. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's have a look. So. Now, for those people who are just joining us on our um, adventure through the original Alien script, uh, you will notice that with the script. Ah, there you are. I'll just switch it back to you. There we go. You're on the screen. Bloody Skype. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't know why it's doing this, but you know. It was a, it's a video call. Why would you not just automatically turn the camera? I, anyway. I don't know. I'll just refocus on you on the screen. Whoop. I don't know why it's not doing it. That's okay. I will just have to do it the hard way. Sorry, everybody, because this is live. We, we don't get to like kind of undo stuff. It's all part of the experience. Yeah. This is why I record podcasts and, and write them. I don't, I don't trust myself. <laughs> yeah. So uh, basically, um, we're going through, uh, maybe I'll get you to read out the list this time uh, of who the characters are. Do you have that page with you? Oh, yeah, go back up to the top. So, the original cast of Dan O'Banion's script for Alien is Chaz Standard. He's the captain, a leader and a politician, believes that any action is better than no action. Martin Robbie, or Roby, executive officer, cautious but intelligent, a survivor. Del Broussard, navigator, adventurer, brash, glory hound. Uh, Sandy Malconis, communications tech, intellectual, a romantic. Uh, Cleve Hunter, mining engineer. High Strong, came along to make his fortune, sounds a little bit like uh, Fifield. And Jay Faust, en engine tech, a worker, unimaginative. <laughs> It's a bit cruel to say that about him. <laughs> it's, it's rude. Who's he supposed to be again? Uh, I think he's supposed to be the equivalent of Brett. Yeah, because Brett's just like, right, every single time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sound like a parrot. Okay. <laughs> so we are on to page 51. So last time we left off, uh, standard... Previously on the alien script. <laughs> Uh, standard says help me come on let's get him up here so they've just gotten uh they've just gotten uh brassard back to the ship and has this uh alien attached to his face so we are going from there on he got face fucked to put it <laughs> yes and, and we just covered that on um prometheus as well so uh yeah. if, you, if you guys listen to prometheus by minute you'll be able to uh hear about a, a different sort of face fucking on a different alien <laughs> uh, movie. A, a theme in our relationship mm. <laughs> so uh do you want to read the action parts and then we'll yeah. stick to our parts again so i i'm last time i was voicing uh i believe del brassard who's now 
incapacitated. <laughs> Who's supposed Makes your job to, easy. Who's supposed to be Lambert, by the way, but like they've, oh. they've swapped the characters around with what happens to them. Because I think the number of, of cast members is still the same. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So I'll, I'll go. Uh, how about I'll go with Malconus and Roby? Okay. All right. And then I was standard, and that was my American accent. How good it is, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> Hunter was the Australian accent, and Faust was my closer to my voice, a bit more English. Right, I've got this. Okay. So I'll just take it from the top of this scene. Mm-hmm. Interior, infirmary. One of them flicks on the lights as they come shuffling into the medical room, carrying Brassard. Revealed as a rather small cubicle whose walls are lined with machinery. The principal item of interest is a mechanized bunk bed, which rests in a cradle and slides in and out of a slot in the wall. Standard. Help me, come on, let's get him up there. They slide the man onto the bunk. Hunter. That thing, God almighty, didn't you try to get it off him? Standard. It wouldn't come off. Uh, It wouldn't come. Uh, Standard yanks off his gloves. Standard, continued. Medical gloves. They uh, they pull thin elastic gloves. Oh, right, okay, so he's taking off one pair of gloves. He's putting... That's a bit misleading. They pull thin elastic gloves from a dispenser in the wall and pull them on. Obviously, very important details here. <laughs> Gingerly, they approach Brassard. Uh, because, I, I don't want to get too off on a tangent here, but yeah, you know, the, the safety, I feel like, in a lot of these alien films... They don't regard it enough, so Dan O'Bannon was was correct on that. I just want to highlight the fact that in Alien Covenant, when they're bringing Ledward back to the ship, mm. she's taking off uh, her, I think it was Faris, is mm. taking off uh, her gloves because she handled Ledward, and then she's yes. the one to put the gloves on when she reaches the medical bay, whereas uh, I think Corinne is just too... Oh my god, what's happening? She's like freaking out and she's trying to she's probably not the most scientific person responding to the situation, which is kind of funny because she's supposed to be the biologist, right? Yeah, well, biologists <laughs> in the alien franchise have been quite a disappointment <laughs> so far. Oh dear, sorry for real biologists out there. <laughs> yeah, no, we just mean like space biologists, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> They're obviously not sending their best people. <laughs> the future is a bleak place. Yes. So, uh, so yes, he got he he's got his gloves on, and gingerly they approach Brassard. Standard places his hand on the octopus thing that is slowly pulsing on Brassard's face. He grasps the tentacles in his hands and tries to pull it free. Standard. It's really on there tight, Faust. Here, let me try. Faust takes a pair of pliers from a rack and carefully grasps the tip of one of the tentacles. Squeezing tightly, he leans back with all his weight. Standard, grabbing Faust's hands. Stop it, you're tearing his face. A trickle of blood begins to ooze down Brassard's cheek. Melkona says, It's not coming off. Not without his whole face coming off too. Standard, let's let the machine work on him. So as we're transitioning to the next page, I just want to highlight that this part usually is executed by Ash in the film. Mm. So because of the absence of Ash in the first script, we've got other characters playing at uh, what ended up being Ash's parts later. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting to relegate the, uh, or I guess Ash is a science officer, so all of the science handling is done by him, all of the operation of the machinery, uh, and then it kind of makes the human crew observers in the whole situation kind of feeling that it's completely out of the, their depth, out of their control. Mm. So I think it adds to it in that sense. Yeah. Uh, continue on to page 52. Efficiently, they strip Brassard naked, then Standard presses a couple of switches on the wall. The machine lights up and Brassard is sucked into the slot in the wall. That's a horrifying way to word that (laughs) he is visible inside the machine immediately sprays a cloud of disinfectant on him then sterilizes him with a blinding pink light 
a bank of video monitors pops on, revealing X-ray images of different parts of his body. Sensors begin to scan. Re relays chatter. Roby appears in the doorway. Standard turns and looks at him. For a long moment, the two men regard each other. Then Standard steps forward and slaps Roby across the face. This sounds a bit familiar. The others are shocked. Hunter. Hey, now, what is this? Standard. Ask him. Roby slowly puts his hand to his cheek. I understand why you did that. Standard. Good. Malcona says. He wouldn't... He wouldn't open up the lock. He was going to leave us out there. Hunter. Yeah, well, maybe you should have. I mean, you brought the goddamn thing in here. Maybe you deserve to get slapped. Faust, embarrassed. Excuse me, I've got work to do. Faust, exits. <laughs> got no time for this shit. <laughs> Hunter. I keep my mouth pretty much shut, but... I don't like hitting. Roby says to Standard, I guess I had it coming. Let's call it settled. After a hard stare at Roby, Standard gives him a curt nod and turns his attention to the machinery. Roby continues slowly. Would somebody fill me in? Standard. He went into the pyramid alone. We lost radio contact with him. When we pulled him out, it was on his face. It won't come off, not without injuring him. And, oh, yeah, Hunter. Uh, I, cause I, was looking, I was looking at the, I was looking at the line below. Okay. <laughs> Hunter, where did it come from? Melconis replies, he's the only one that knows that. Hunter, how does he breathe? A study the monitors. Mulconus replies, Blood's thoroughly oxygenated. Yeah, but how? His nose and mouth are blocked. Standard. Let's look inside his head. Standard punches some buttons, and on the monitors, a kind of X-ray image is in vivid colors appears, depicting Brassard's head and upper torso. The parasite is clearly visible on Brassard's face. In X-Ray, the creature is a maze of complicated biology, but the shocking thing is that in X-Ray, we can see that Brassard's jaw, uh, uh, Brassard's jaws are forced wide open, and the parasite has extruded some kind of long tube which is stuffed into his mouth, down his throat, ending near his stomach. Roby says, look at that. Hunter. What is it? I, I can't tell anything. Roby says, it's some kind of organ. It's inserted some sort of kind of tube or something down his throat. Hunter, turning sick. Oh, God. Hunter bends over and wretches. <laughs> Roby says, I think that's how it's getting oxygen to him. Hunter, it doesn't make any sense. It paralyzes him, puts him into a coma, then keeps him alive. Melconis says, We can't expect to understand a life form like this. We're out of our backyard. Things are different here. Well, can't we kill it? I mean, we can't leave the damn thing on him. Melconis says, We don't know what might happen if we tried to kill it. At least right now, it's keeping him alive. How about cutting it off? We can't pull it loose, but we can cut off everything but the bottom layer, where it's stuck to his face. Standard. You're right. We can't just... We can't stand here and do nothing. Standard picks up his dusty breathing mask and pulls it over his head. Then he pulls back, uh, pulls back on his bulky gloves. Finally, he presses a switch, and Brassard slides back out of the booth. Standard, muffled in the mask. Somebody give me a scalpel. Or it should be, somebody give me a scalpel. <laughs> <laughs> Melconis takes a glittering surgical blade from a slot in the wall and carefully passes it to Standard. Clumsily, because of the gloves, Standard manipulates the knife in his hand till he has a decent grip on it. Then he flicks a little button with his thumb. The scalpel begins to hum. 
Standard advances on the parasite. The others draw back nervously. Roby reaches over and draws yet another blade from the rack and holds it inconspicuously at his side. Standard bends over the parasite. Carefully, he touches the scalpel to the extreme end of one of the tentacles, where it curves towards the back of Brassard's head. Effortlessly, the electronic blade slides through the alien tissue. Immediately, a urine-like fluid begins to flow from the wound. Standard. <laughs> Beautiful. I mean, it is sort of a piss color in the movie. Yeah, I, I guess I'm kind of glad they kept that. I guess all of this sort of stuff is supposed to evoke this sort of like, ew, not Body feeling... horror. Yeah, not feeling comfortable with all of this like sex and disgusting bodily fluids, even mm. Ash's own blood, even though Ash is not in the script, is evocative of um, semen and stuff like that, so... Yeah, I covered that in uh, in my Alien Day special about androids, and it, it is interesting that, uh, you know, they could have just had a standard android, standard, uh, android <laughs> with, you know, there's no fluid or anything, or if there is, it's probably like black oil. No, 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 they went for something that's a bit disturbing, a bit too evocative of biological matter, mm. and... Uh, Oh god, that's what went right in my head now. Uh, oh yes, when I look at fan fiction, um, dirty fan fiction. Not that I want to. It's just it's there. Tumblr's just like you want to see this, right? No. <laughs> but... Anyway, sometimes I see David covered in white, and I just have to go. Please be blood. Please be blood. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to highlight, like, because we've just passed that page, <clears throat> page fifty-four. They're talking about an X-ray, uh, which they're looking at. Uh, where Brassard's jaws have been forced open. Now, in the film, they've actually got, uh, I think it's an ultrasound image or a micros microscope camera image of a chick um, being um, incubated in an egg. And that's oh, what they used that. instead. So if you have a look on um, Alien, which I've got playing in the background there, uh, you'll see on the screen Ash is studying uh, something. And then on the screen it has this little uh, embryo of a chick <laughs> and and that's what fox decided to do instead of showing an x-ray with uh Brassard or or kane's uh jaw being forced open with the um uh what do they call it it's not called uh there's proper wording for it i'll remember it in a sec <laughs> uh but the tube going from the face hugger down the throat so Originally, because I was speaking to J.W. Rinsor about this on Alien Day, he, he's not sure about the origins of this piece, but there was a piece uh, done by Joe Patagno where it shows an X-ray of a human head with a face hugger with the um, tube going right down into the lungs or the stomach and then all of this like tumour or something kind of spreading out, which kind of looks like the way the black goo kind of roots itself into making a, an alien. Mm. So so they saw that image and it's like they said, nah, we are not putting that on a movie screen. Even though, as you see in the movie, it's so tiny in the background, you hardly notice what it is. So um, <laughs> it's an interesting it's choice. It's weird that they would censor that. You, you see that a lot in even to this day censorship seems to be so arbitrary and uh the the best example i always think of is in the hannibal nbc tv series they had these two victims that uh were killed via the the blood eagle which is this supposed ritual that the vikings did where the ribs were broken at the back and pulled outward to look like wings mm. And so they were sort of propped up in this and these sort of uh, angels on their knees praying and uh, suspended from the ceiling and very graphic image. I don't think anyone would, would argue that NBC had no problem with it. Producers were like, yeah, it's fine. Um, but, <laughs> but we can see butts is <laughs> yes. the problem here. They, we, you, they're naked. There's butt cracks. So could you like, do something about that. So the visual effects team just had to put blood, more blood trickling down the back into into the crack so that you, you can't see butt crack. And NBC's like, great, it's not offensive at all. It's just like, 
that is American censorship right there, that the, the natural human form, everyone has a butt. You know, we see animals walk around, they got their buttholes on display. Blood is is apparently better than... I just... I don't understand the logic there. Like, more violence, less nudity. Okay. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's just so strange. And especially in something like Alien, where there's just so much gore and horror. And, and I guess the, all the sex is kind of suggested. And just mm. having a man flating an alien probably went a little bit too far for them. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> I will never understand. <laughs> Back to the script. Oh, and and but uh, those people who attended the USC screening, by the way, uh, they did discuss um, uh, Sigourney Weaver fellating the newborn in unseen footage, which was never used in the movie because <laughs> Jean Pierre Genet <laughs> fellating its its a, a long tongue when when the newborn had a really long. Tongue, I believe. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so other is like the, the the small. I thought it was a smaller jaw, but I'm not sure because I'm I'm hearing from um, I think it was Alien Archive that was talking about it. By the way, if you guys are on Twitter, follow Alien Archive. They always post really interesting stuff. Uh, and Perfect Organism Podcast was there. So if you want to hear about uh, the Alien Resurrection viewing and what happens there, uh, you can go follow their page and their Twitter. Okay. So, yeah. Who'd want to see that? Who wants to see Sigourney Weaver filleted an alien? <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> no. Too much on the nose for me. That's uh, that's quite enough. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that was not the ship I was going for with the resurrection. <laughs> Definitely not with the newborn. <laughs> no, no one ships that. Sorry, Except newborn. Pierre Jeanette. <laughs> <laughs> no offence, Jean-Pierre. <laughs> I'm sure someone out there would appreciate that, but no. There's probably found out of it. It has to, it has to exist. <laughs> Rule 34, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> page 55 of the script. Uh, yes. <laughs> what uh, so we're up to, to piss blood. It's piss and blood, and piss it's blood. bloody piss, and it's right. piss and... <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm a professional. <laughs> Um, by now, the yellow fluid has eaten a hole through the bunk bed and has... It's not really a bunk bed, because it's not one above the other. Let's let's get serious here. Um, but it's more of a... What do you call it when it comes out of a wall? It's, God, I even talked about this on my podcast. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. It's anyway. Fl- floating bed. Yeah. Now nah, it's going to kill me. I'm going to wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh, it's that word. But I don't remember, right? <laughs> so by now the yellow fluid has eaten a hole through the bunk bed and has dripped down onto the floor below. The metal floor begins to bubble and sizzle and more smoke rises. The men start to cough. And I believe you are Melkonis. I can't believe it. because like you're on a scrolling page and I'm on a like an actual script guys and I didn't realize you got, <laughs> got to the other side already I'm like where am I okay <laughs> <coughs> god that smokes poison poisonous hunter. <laughs> poison yeah. hunter pointing it's <coughs> it's eating a hole in the floor Abruptly, the men jostle their way out of the room and huddle in the corridor outside, coughing their lungs out. Standard, who is... Mu- it's just the 70s. Like, everyone's smoking, so that's just, like, how everyone sounds. <laughs> uh, Standard, who is masked, remains. Frantically attempts to put a bandage on the wound, but the fluid instantly melts the bandage. I mean, duh. And the, in the process, some of the sm- stuff gets on Standard's gloves. They begin to smoke. Frantically, Standard leaps back, pulling off the smouldering gloves. Then he runs out into the corridor and yanks off his mask. That's not something that happens in the film, is it? No, they... It seems to smell noxious, but it's not that uh, catastrophic. Yeah, they only kind of have that reaction in Aliens, where uh, it, the, the acid gets onto their armour, and then they kind of yeah. like strip it off. So there's that sense of urgency there. 
Hmm. Interesting. Interior, corridor, outside infirmary, standard. That stuff's eating right through the metal. It's going to eat through the decks and right out through the hull. By the time standard has started to run, uh, by this time standard has started to run for the stairs. I find standard talks in a way that is very different from the way I do. I'm very precise with my wording, and he sort of he he, he omits words or he sort of he says it in a very loose, casual way. So I'm like, oh, oh, you mean okay? Yeah, that's how you structure a sentence, I guess. If if you're standard. Yeah, and I I guess the the way they've written. Um... The captain, uh, he's very laid back. He's not mm. like you know, uh, very regimented. Yeah. And and I guess that's the way that uh, Dallas is played in the film as well. Mm. So he's very laid back, even when he's like giving the orders to the crew. He lets Ash put rein them in with the words and and like following company orders instead of yeah, I taking the lead. Standard might be standard Dallas. They're the only character who remained pretty consistent in terms of characterization. That the captain had a defined personality, and it stays right till the final version. Mm. All right. Um. Mm. <laughs> Where are we up to? Oh yes, so he's run for the stairs. Interior corridors in the ship. I mean, it wouldn't be the corridors outside the ship, but yeah. <laughs> Better stop being a smart ass. Okay. Followed by the others, Standard frantically clangs down the stairs to an, the level below. Standard, there, look! A droplet of fluid is sizzling on the ceiling. It oozes down and drips to the floor. It bubbles on the floor. Malconis says, Jesus, what can we put under it? Standard and a hunter charge down the stairs to the level below. Interior, level below. Standard and Hunter move cautiously down the corridor, looking up at the ceiling. Standard, pointing. There, should be coming through about there. Hunter, careful, don't get under it. Interior, level above. Ruby and Malconus crouch by the spot on the floor where the acid sizzles. Malconus says, Christ, that stinks. Ruby fishes out a pen out of his pocket and probes into the hole in the floor like Ash does. Roby says, seems to have stopped penetrating. Hunter comes charging up the stairs. Hunter, what's happening up here? Roby says, I think it's fizzled out. Hunter approaches and looks. Roby straightens up, starts to put the pen back in his pocket, then changes his mind and stands holding it by the end. Malcona says, I've never saw anything like that in my life, except for molecular acid. Yeah, molecular acid, that's <laughs> a thing. How, when, when do you have an opportunity to see molecular acid? Maybe, I guess, in a YouTube video, if YouTube exists in the alien universe? Maybe, but acid is a molecule. I mean, it's the, it's the pH balance of matter, so it's not... It, <laughs> It's not a matter of this is acid on in a molecular level. It's like, well, is it apple cider vinegar under a microscope? Is it battery <laughs> acid under a microscope? Like, what the fuck are you talking about molecular acid? <laughs> it's the same thing. I've been watching a lot of Star Trek The Next Generation, and it's just, well, if we can penetrate the firewall of the blah, 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 and it's just all that techno babble that means absolutely jack shit, especially when it was written in the 80s and I'm watching it in 2019. So I'm just going, well, I know how technology works and you guys don't, so. <laughs> uh, um, while we're paused and discussing molecular acid. I just want to say hi to Styles Gaming, who's joined us today. Hi, Styles. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Anyone else who's in chat, feel free to say hi. <laughs> don't be shy. Um, we don't bite. I mean, we do bite, but not much. <laughs> <laughs> You're at a safe enough distance, and yes. I've had my shots. <laughs> um, I've already eaten today. We're good. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Hunter, Hunter. Uh, on page 58. But this thing uses it for blood? Melkonis says, Hell of a defense mechanism. You don't dare kill it. And that line got right into the final film. 
It did. And of all people, I think it is Parker that says it. Yes. Which is okay. like... With, with the stereotype, especially in science fiction back then, in regards to race, they generally don't give the more scientific or complicated lines to people of colour. And that was just the way that they did it back then. But they've kind of changed the the mixture of uh, Parker being a very competent man, always looking out for himself, but always looking out for his friends and still being able to keep up scientifically with the other people. And I think he, is he the one that says something about molecular acid as well? I think so. I'm going to have to watch it again. I've watched... <laughs> yeah, I've watched it so many times and yet... It all just uh, melts together now. I think now. maybe Prometheus is the only movie, you know, I've watched it one minute at a time where I can actually say, no, I know every single little detail because I've actually, you know, researched every minute. But most other films, you've seen them, but you don't remember those sorts of details. Yeah, I, I'm definitely going to have to watch it again. I think Parker, you could talk a lot about Parker and how he fits into black representation in cinema history in general, but science fiction specifically, that he is the big aggressive male, which, you know, is not a particularly progressive way of depicting a black man in fiction. But he's also, he's quite heroic, especially towards the end. He starts off as quite... um, Yes, self-interested. He only cares about the, the, the pay, getting paid, uh, the bonus situation. But <laughs> no, he's he's a strategist. He's a survivor. He his relationship with Brett is very humanizing as well. So I think you know everyone focuses on Ripley and how women are portrayed in Alien. But I think uh, as for minorities in general. I think this film has done a pretty good job, especially considering the time it was made. Mm, Yeah, absolutely. And I guess they've kind of brought a similarity to that character with Yannick in Prometheus as well, because Mm. he's like, I just fly the ship, you know? Yeah, I can really respect those sorts of characters where they're they're pretty level-headed, they're they they're the ones who they they do last the longest because they're just practical, <laughs> but there is a sense of honor about those characters. Mm. And also, Idris Elba is really cool. So, you know. yeah, he <laughs> is, and I, he played Yannick so well. I'm trying to think. It's really just on television and and film around this time. Well, okay, so about five ten years from Alien, you've got like Urkel who is, you know, the black nerd, and you've got Geordie LaForge, who is uh, an engineer, you know, very scientifically competent, but you don't see a lot of characters like that at all, I would say, pre-1980s. Mm. I literally cannot think of an example, and that's not good. Uh, for anyone out there, feel free to chime in, or uh, I'll, I'll do my research and add that as footnotes to the blog, because I think it's definitely something worth um, looking into. God damn it, now I'm going to write a whole other essay about Parker. <laughs> Never ends. You should, you should. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. We should probably get back on track. Um, <laughs> yes, so standard comes up the stairs. Standard, it stopped. Mulcona says, yes, thank heaven. Standard. We're just plain lucky. That could have gone right through the hole, taken weeks to patch it. Or you get sucked out the hole like the, the newborn. <laughs> Because that's how science works. That's that's how they were originally going to kill Lambert in one of the iterations of Alien. Oh, 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 oh. no, that's Could bad enough when it's that? a puppet. Human being, no. But it's 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 cool that an unused idea ended up being used in a later film, even though people do not love Resurrection at all. I, I love it. We should do a podcast or a stream defending Resurrection, because yeah. there's, there's some shit in there. I reckon... Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, it's probably got an anniversary coming up at some point. Yeah, absolutely. And, like, there, there's a lot of focus on Alien at the moment and a lot of rejection of res- Resurrection, especially after the USC uh, screening, which we can share a bit, some tidbits about that as well. So, yeah. In yeah. De- in defense of Resurrection. <laughs> I, I, I pretty much love every Alien movie. I, you know, there's obviously... Some I love more than others, but 
honestly, I know there's some real divided camps of like, I'm on, the, you know, Ridley Scott's vision. That's what I'm all about. Just alien, nothing else. Or James Cameron had it right. Da 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 da. Whereas I, <laughs> yeah, I even Alien versus Predator, I can find some enjoyment in those films, and I, I just, I'm, I'm grateful to just get any Alien at all. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think Alien Three. It's challenging. It's very. It's miserable. So it's not one you tend to just want to put on for fun. Mm, yeah. <laughs> But it's it's definitely a well told story, despite all the challenges behind the scenes. Mm. And then Resurrection again. It's very jarring because it's so different. But then you got to stand back and go, well, what's what's normal for Alien? Because each one of those films is vastly different from the last. Yeah, and I think all of them kind of. Bring their own sort of style. I like that they're all so very different. I actually kind of wish that the Marvel movies were like that, where you got these real. Um, well, I mean, you got Taika Waititi, but more of that, where you get a someone with a very specific. Um, what do you call it? O- oeuvre, very specific style. Um, or tour directors, if you will, mm. and just do something really crazy. It doesn't really have to tie into continuity. But I mean that would be fun and unexpected, and that's what I love about Alien is that I honestly don't know what I'm in for. Every single time they make a new one of these, I have no idea. Yeah, I I kind of miss the changes. Like even though love Ridley Scott, love the prequels, but I like the fact that they did go with a different director each time. There's a certain mm. charm about it, and makes the series a bit more unpredictable, but in a good way. Well, that's kind of like the pre-MCU Marvel movies. You know, you'd have Spider-Man by Sam Raimi, and it would feel very much like a Sam Raimi movie. And then you'd have something as balls to the wall insane as, like, Ang Lee directing the Hulk, or um, oh, I can't remember the director's name who, who directed Catwoman, and you just go... I mean, they're insane, but they're really entertaining. And it's the same thing with Alien 4. We're just going, who who approves this? It's a wonderful disaster. It's great. I love it. <laughs> Sometimes you just want good trash. Is that so hard to ask for? Uh, good trash. I like that. <laughs> yes. I'm a raccoon. Give it to me. <laughs> All right, we better get back on track. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting, we're on a good track. Yeah, um, doing pretty well. So, uh, in interior, infirmary, uh, did we do, no, is it still dripping? It appears to have filled itself. Did we do that? Or no, no we, we were up to, uh, yes, thank before. heaven. And you, you were standard. Who's next? We're just plain lucky. Yes. All right. Uh, We're just, yeah, we're just playing lucky. That could have gone right through the hole, taken weeks to patch it. Reminded, uh, this is Melkonis, by the way, reminded me of when I was a kid and the roof leaked, everybody running for the pots and pans. Yeah, great, useful story right now, dude. <laughs> Roby says, my God, what about Brassard? They turn and run up the stairs. Interior, infirmary. They all come into the room, Roby carrying the partially melted pen, Brassard is still motionless on the bunk while the thing, uh, with the thing on his face. Roby says, did it get on him? Standard approaches and peers at Brassard's head. No, thank God, just missed him. Malcona says, is it still dripping? It appears to have healed itself. Hunter, makes me sick to see him like that. Malcona says, isn't there some way we could get it off him? And it, I just don't see how, but let's do what we can for him. Standard presses a button and Brassard slides back into the diagnostic coffin. He presses more buttons and the displays light up again, showing different parts of Brassard's body. Standard. I think we better get some intravenous feeding started. God knows what this thing is leeching out of him. Standard operates some controls and the machine begins to invade Brassard's body, sliding needles into him. Roby says, studying the screens, Look here. What's that stain on his lungs? 
The X-ray, X-ray reveals a spreading dark blot on the vicinity in the vicinity of Broussard's chest. In the center, the stain is completely opaque. Balcona says, "It appears to be a heavy fluid of some sort. It blocks the X-rays." Ro- Roby then says, "That tube must be depositing it in him." Balcona says, "Could be some kind of venom or poison." It's either one or the other. If it's uh, if it's coming out of an animal, it's venom. It's poison, it's, it's chemical. <laughs> Hunter, this is horrible. Roby says, hey, what about the film? Standard. What film? Roby says, Brassard had film in his data stick, didn't he? We can just see what happened to him. Interior, multi-purpose room. Again, we are watching slides in the darkened room. This time, Standard, Ruby, Malconis, and Hunter are watching the sequence of photographs taken automatically by Brassard's data stick as he probed the tomb. The camera reveals the urns. The climax of the sequence of stills comes from the cre- when the creature leaps out of the urn towards camera. And after that, the camera drops to a useless angle and proceeds to show a series of meaningless blurs. Then the real real <laughs> ends. All right, let's let's pause it there. So again, back to the urns. So this is the unused concept in Prometheus, and the data stick is kind of like. Oh, there's the music from Dallas. Um, <laughs> then there is the. He is uh, not a classical music guy. <laughs> oh, she. Do you, do you think it was a bad choice that they I think it should. Yeah, should have been bloody country roads. <laughs> maybe, maybe. No, nah, this isn't some like meatloaf. There we go. That <laughs> I think he, that that's his kind of thing. Who, who would have been around in the seventies that they could have poached music from? That's timeless now. Only Are you saying had... meatloaf isn't timeless? <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't think it's Actually, suited for the Alien series. Probably Simon and Garfunkel, really. Like, in terms of songs, or especially the lyrics that sort of permeated culture and and seem to still be people doing covers, Simon and Garfunkel, maybe. I guess it's licensing as well, because it would cost more, a lot more money to use Simon and Garfunkel. True. <laughs> uh, so, as well as that, they're looking through these 3D scans on the computer and of course that is used in Prometheus in the form of Fifield's pups scanning the pyramid so it's really cool yeah, my pups yes <laughs> that it is uh yes the only only um geologist thing he does in the whole damn movie mm-hmm. <laughs> uh he may as well not have come along they could have just brought the pups <laughs> yeah maybe maybe, that's the maybe whole they point. Can- they like, came as a joint sort of deal. Yeah, maybe maybe humans are pretty much obsolete. They they keep on referencing that in the novels, at least. That, uh, oh, that's cool. Yeah, because I do keep thinking about why did you have to pay humans to come on this mission? Why don't you just bring along like six Davids? Oh wait, because you don't want six Davids. <laughs> but I mean, like other androids you know why would you even bother um in detroit become human i know i reference that a lot but it's very important okay i have a point here <laughs> and uh in one of the magazines that you know it sort of expands on the law of that world and they um the russians and the americans and i think the chinese are all racing against each other to send uh expeditions android manned expeditions to the antarctic and also to mars and i think other planets if i recall but uh basically yeah why if you can do that why not Mm. i think i think that's what they kind of touch on in alien covenant origins for people who haven't read it out there uh that even though walter is kind of caretaker of the ship he can't make any make any major uh decisions uh, when it comes down to it, it's the humans that get to do that. Yeah, um, and I actually, the yeah, origins is, is not bad in terms of showing us for once what Earth looks like and what the culture's like and, and the thinking behind these decisions. Um, they did a really good job. Oh, that's um, bloody uh, Alan Dean Foster. 
And yeah, he, he sort of shows that Walter is limited in, in all these different ways, which I found quite fascinating. Yeah, and the fact that they, when they progress later on, obviously Bishop can start making decisions. Like, I had an argument with someone on Tumblr about this, whether Bishop uh, was given enough... Um, <sighs> Not given enough screen time. That's definitely <laughs> we can agree on that. That that he can make any major decisions because he piloted the dropship. To, he decided it was too unstable and he was going to go around again and come back. Um, but I was saying like, yeah, but that that was a decision to recover the humans. At the end of the day, he can't make a decision of where the ship goes, how the mission will fare, etc. Yeah, in terms of, um, I guess, command decisions. And uh, there is, a, I've been watching a lot of TNG lately, but yes, in The Next Generation, there's an episode where Data says, well, why, I've been serving on the ship for ages. I'm perfectly capable of being a captain. Why aren't you allowing me to have that opportunity? And yeah, Picard's really hesitant. And it, it's a real good episode. I can't remember what it was called, but he gets on this other ship and this one guy is really not happy about us. You know, you're, you're a machine. We don't trust you. You don't have respect human lives. We're just a statistic to you. And well, in that case, data was able to emulate emotions. He was able to get very stern and, uh, you know, use the right tone of voice and stuff to incite the kind of behavior in his crew that he wanted. I don't think Walter or even Bishop, would be capable of that because they have been so specifically limited. Um, any sort of I don't know, dominant behavior, uh, anything that allows them to think for themselves or make executive decisions, it's just too risky. Mm. And I can't Im imagine anyone, especially a person like Oram, if he was just a regular crew member, taking orders from a robot ever yeah exactly <laughs> and that's probably one of the biggest issues and something we might see in the real world there's a lot of discussion about well why don't we bring ai into politics why don't we have ai just get to know an individual and their philosophical and political beliefs and preferences and then when it comes to an election time the AI can sort of relay to you, well, I think you want to vote Greens because you're very much uh, left-leaning and you care about these issues and that sort of stuff. And it will tell you, you know, the more specific details. But there's a real backlash to that. People already are just like, I don't want a machine telling me what to think and what to do and how to vote. It's like, but you don't know how to vote properly. You probably, you know, <laughs> I don't use vote compass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is. I mean, that that's an AI, a very simple one. But people are already resisting the idea of AI as authority. I think, uh, and yeah, I think when you give uh, AI or robots too much agency, that's when you give up your own. So, mm. I mean, that's how a lot of people see it, and it'll be really interesting to see where this goes in the future um just to quickly sort of wrap up this, this tangent but if you want to look more into it uh the scenario is called the caged god scenario sam harris talks about it a bit uh and there's a few other ted talks and stuff i've heard referencing this and it's basically that we have given this being almost omniscience you know god-like knowledge and yet we don't trust it to make the necessary decisions. Um, I think Sam Harris himself made that the analogy of it's like you're the only adult in a world of toddlers and they've caged you up because they don't trust you because they don't want a grown up bossing them around. But then they come to you and they're like, oh, we need we need to cook things. Do you know how to make fire? But they don't trust you to make fire. <laughs> Definitely a very interesting analogy there. Yeah. Especially with the whole event of the story of Prometheus. Yes, and you're surrounded by toddlers. <laughs> Not to worry you, but... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we're up to uh, Hunter. Yes. Uh, that must have been when he got it. Roby says, The same thing must have happened to the creatures on the other ship, except they took one of those jars on board and opened it there. Malconis clicks back through the slides to a picture of the urns. At first I thought they were jars too. Artifacts anyway, but they're not. They're eggs. 
or spore casings. Let's go back to the hieroglyphics. <laughs> clickety click, clickety click. <laughs> Malconus <laughs> accelerates through the slides. My God. I, um, I was just thinking about this the other day, not to tangent too much, but just uh, how physical technology was. You know, everything we have now is sliding and, and you know, scrolling up and down and, and swiping. And just back then it was just like when you're typing, it's <laughs> And then, oh, this lever, and you got to, like, really... <laughs> it very heavy buttons on everything. You really knew that you definitely activated whatever you wanted to activate. Um, and I really can't think of any examples. Oh, okay, so, again, Next Generation might be the first example I can think of with the touchscreen thing where everyone's just... Yeah, it's a flat screen, and it's no swiping gestures or anything. Oh, a little bit. But before that, and I think Alien, it's it's become kind of a stylistic choice at this point where everything is very manual and bulky. Uh, Star Wars as well continues an aesthetic that wasn't even really an aesthetic in the 70s. That was just reality. Mm, that's true. And I'm kind of glad that they've semi-updated this sort of uh, interaction with technology with the prequels because then they kind of, made it you know there's a range of technology that ranges from like really hyper futuristic that we see in prometheus somewhere in the middle we see in covenant and then that sort of cassette futurism that we see in alien i think it makes yeah. sense that in order to make more films in the future they needed to update the past if, you know yeah they've they found a nice equilibrium and i think it's fairly plausible to go well yeah, Prometheus was a state-of-the-art ship. I mean, imagine you look at the Titanic and then you look at a modern, uh, you know, uh, like a fishing boat and you'd go, oh, well, the Titanic's obviously newer than that. It's like, no, it's just more money went into it and it's a luxury thing. Uh, and the Prometheus is definitely a luxury ship. Whereas... Um, yeah, I, I, I compare Alien, and they always talk about it, but I, I think of Alien as, like, the, the big equipment and stuff that you have, like, up in, uh, in Australia, in our, in our mining towns, like Caratha and stuff. This stuff looks ancient, it's really, it's manual, it's just very uh, old-fashioned, but it's what it needs to be. And I feel like, especially if you're so isolated out there, it's not like you're just going to take it to some sort of engineering repair place. You've got engineers on board. Things need to be be able to be repaired by at least two people only. Mm. Uh, and you don't want to make it too complicated because you don't want to get stranded out in the middle of nowhere. So, yeah. you know, makes sense to me. All right. Uh, yeah, so clickety-click. <laughs> uh, Malconus accelerates through the slides in a blur, stopping at the one he wants, which shows a strip of hieroglyphs on the wall of the tomb. Standard. I personally can't make any sense of it. Click, click. Malconus is changing the slides as they talk, showing different angles of the glyphs. Malconus says, it's a, it's a crude symbolic language. Looks primitive. Hunter, you can't tell. That kind of stuff could represent printed circuits or... Uh, yeah, that, that tone of voice is weird. You can't tell what kind of stuff would... If you say so. <laughs> Standard. It sounds a little fanciful. Malcona says, primitive pri well, sorry about this. <laughs> primitive, primitive pictorial. <laughs> primitive yes. pictorial languages are based on common objects in the environment, and this can be used as a starting point for translation. Roby says, what common objects? Uh, your turn. <laughs> Listen, hadn't somebody better check on Brassard? Standard, rising. I'll do it. The rest of you continue. Hunter. Rising. I'll, co I'll come with you. Interior. Corridor. Outside. Infirmary. Standard and Hunter come down the passageway. Standard. You know, it's fantastic. The human race has gone this long without ever encountering another advanced life form, and now we run into a veritable zoo. Hunter. What do you mean? Standard. Well, those things out there aren't the same, you know, the spaceship and the pyramid. They're from different cultures and different races. That ship just landed here, crashed like we did. The pyramid and the thing in it, the thing, the thing in it are indigenous. Hunter. Uh, 
A- additional note just before we continue. Um, apparently, uh, Dan O'Bannon never watched the movie The Thing, even though people have said uh, something about him being inspired by it. He actually hadn't seen it yet. Yeah, when did The Thing come out? 82, gonna... I believe. Oh, okay. So that yeah came after then. Mm. Unless they mean the original thing. Mm. Which I don't know what it's like. I'm assuming it's just as bad as the original The Fly. <laughs> oh boy, have you ever seen that? Uh, I've seen parts of it. I've seen all the memed parts of it, but I've never the actually watched it. I mean, it. yeah, the, the whole thing's a meme. It's just like this dude with a fucking fly hat on his <laughs> helmet. Ugh. Oh. Uh, whereas, yeah, I mean, that's that's a prime example. And I also think Alien, you know, seeing how this has evolved through the scripts and, and through its execution and stuff, how something can just be quite a cheesy B-grade story. But it's really down to execution. It really is, how do you perform it? How do you film it? How do you pace this? How do you edit it? It can be the difference between the original Fly and Cronenberg's The Fly. Mm-hmm. And I think it's uh, definitely the director in this mm. case. Because, for example, if we got Jean-Pierre Genet to direct Alien, it would come out completely different. <laughs> yeah, there'd be way more lesbian subtext. There'd be... Um, sex scene yeah. with the alien. Yeah, more, more sex scenes with the alien. Uh, lots, yeah. m- lots more jokes as well, I think. Yeah, it would just be goofy AF. <laughs> Oh, God, I just remember the opening scene of Resurrection. It's just, that's how you open your movie? Okay, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Hunter, how could anything be indigenous to this asteroid? It's dead. Standard. It's a planet, not an asteroid. Uh, standard. Uh, maybe it wasn't always dead. They arrive at the infirmary. I do think that's a really cool idea that you've got, you know, two or three different cultures encountering each other here where normally it's just you go to an alien planet, them's aliens, they're all working together. Mm. Uh, I also want to w- wind back a bit, talking about the beginning of Resurrection, and, and you, you are talking about the director's cut where they swat the fly, and the fly is supposed yep. to look like an alien. <laughs> and the CGI looks like something out of a Backstreet Boys <laughs> musical, music video. Not that I've ever seen a Backstreet Boys music video, what are you talking about? <laughs> but... Um, they used that exact opening for Jurassic World, and it worked. Yes, they did. <laughs> all in the execution. Good point. It all comes back together. Mm. Interior, infirmary. The door slides open, and they step into the room. Hunter activates the bed, and it slides out of the wall. I share a house with other people, just in case you're wondering about the background noise. Continuing on. <laughs> interior, infirmary. Were we not already interior, infirmary? Uh, whatever. This, the there door... is a long, horrified pause. You're up to there. <laughs> mm. uh, the door slides open and they step into the room. Standard activates the bed and it slides out of the wall. There is a long, horrified pause. Hunter, it's gone. They rush to Brassard's prone form. The parasite is gone from his face. It's all in capitals. <laughs> I should scream more the capitals. Brassard is still unconscious, but he is breathing. His face is covered with sucker marks! <laughs> Hunter, now we're in for it. Now we're fucked! <laughs> yeah, that's what you should have said. Standard. Uh, the door was closed. It must be in here somewhere. They immediately grow very tense. Hunter starts edging toward the door. Standard grabs his arm. Standard. No, don't open the door. We don't want it escaping. Hunter, very nervous. Well, what the, what the hell good can we do in here? It can't. We can't grab it. It might jump on us. Uh, standard. Maybe we can. Maybe we can catch it. Standard picks up a stainless steel tray. Very important. That's stainless. Stainless steel tray with a lid. Standard continued. As long as we're careful not to damage it. Tray in one hand, lid in the other. He's trying to catch it like a spider, as he did. Standard. It is a spider. Mm -hmm. Standard begins moving slowly around the room. There are very few places to hide. He bends down and peers under the bunk. 
and he is down on his hands and knees. We see one tentacle. I mean, we see one tentacle of the thing <laughs> vibrating on a ledge just above standard. He rises. His shoulder rushes the tentacle. The parasite drops to the floor. Standard leaps back. Shit! What for you guys? Uh, I scrolled up too far, so now the Skype thing comes away. Uh, but the thing is not moving. It lies motionless on the floor, its tentacles curled up. Its colour is faded to a dead-looking grey. Uh, sort, of, sort of a smoky grey, like more of an ashen grey, yeah. Uh, without taking his eyes off the thing, Standard reaches behind him and takes a long probe from the wall. He probes, probes the, prods the thing, not probes the thing. He prods the thing, it does not respond. Standard. I think it's dead. With great care, he uses the probe to fish the motionless parasite into the tray. Then he quickly closes the lid. Interior. Right. Uh, just before we keep going, I just wanted to share. I will share a video of a lady getting her face sucked off by an octopus when she's trying to eat it live. By the way, it uh, oh. went viral on Weibo. Uh, she totally deserved it. Anyway. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, octopuses are our friends, not food. Mm, and they are very intelligent. So. Yeah, I read a book. I really recommend it. A Soul of an Octopus by uh, Cy Montgomery. My mm -hmm. bookshelf's over there, can you tell? <laughs> and it's like, oh, Alan, uh, Alan Dean Foster. Yeah, it's very handy. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely fantastic non-fiction book about this woman who researched octopuses and they are the closest thing to aliens. They truly are another species. They're so intelligent. And there are things we don't understand about them, like perhaps each individual tentacle has its own personality and consciousness and what is consciousness. And, ah, you know, as someone who is fascinated by AI... Uh, octopuses are, are another another thing that really captures my imagination and fascination because it is in that uncanny valley and it, it raises a lot of philosophical questions yeah uh, also highlighting the fact that the face hugger is not the face hugger yet it's an octopus and they ended oh, up yeah. using this concept in Prometheus in in the form of the trilobite uh, and, and we can see after the trilobite delivers its payload into the engineer it turns that gray color and kind of fizzes up into a dead uh, organism so I, I like how they ended up using that concept from the original script in Prometheus mm. all right um, I wish we could go again <laughs> Uh, what did you do? Closes the lid. Interior laboratory. Standard, Ruby, and Melconis have the parasite spread eagled on a stainless steel table with a bright light on it. Was stainless steel new back then or something? It must have been, or maybe it looked very sci fi. Maybe. Chrome. Chrome everything. <laughs> That's more 60s. Uh, it is belly side up. Uh, wearing gloves, standard probes a thing with an instrument standard. Look at these suckers. No wonder we couldn't get it off. We couldn't get it off him. Roby says, Is that its mouth? Malkona says, More well, likely the organ, the tube like thing. Proboscis. Proboscis. <laughs> they should say. Uh, fits up in there. With a pair of needle nose pliers, standard fishes in the fleshy aperture. Fleshy aperture. <laughs> God, that's a great. Gross. Aperture. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I just made it so. Mm, no, you're welcome. Uh... <laughs> Thanks, Connor. <laughs> uh, I'm shuddering. No. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say it. No, I won't say it again. Uh, carefully, he extra extracts the end of the tube organ. <laughs> Some great phrases here. Thanks, Dan O'Bannon. <laughs> Roby says, Ugh. Rightly so, from the shoe bargain. <laughs> Suddenly it starts to fall apart in the flyers. Standard, quick, it's decomposing, give me something to grab it with. It begins to smoke and bubble. 
Ruby grabs a long pair of tongs from the wall and thrusts them at Standard. I've got to start doing the rolled R's, but anyway. Uh, and thrusts them at Standard, who throws down the pliers, snatches the tongs, and seizes the thing in the tongs. It is smouldering and dripping acid on the floor. Standard continued, Christ, let's get it out of here. Carrying the thing, he heads for the door. Interior corridors in the ship. The men run down the passageways, standard carrying the dripping thing in the tongs. It leaves little smoking droplets on the floor. It sounds like me trying to carry some expired meat to the bin <laughs> without dropping it everywhere because I took it out of the plastic container and didn't realize that it had expired and now it's a mess and god damn. Yeah. It's hell. Hell on earth, I tell you. <laughs> Interior, corridor, dark, <laughs> outside airlock. I don't even know where I saw that word. Okay. Just make up words. Um, corridor outside the airlock. They come running up the airlock. Ro- Robbie, Ruby stabs the button and the inner door slides open. By the time Standard is in the lock, Ruby is already on the intercom. By the way, I'm just going to change my voice into the echo system so it sounds like I'm on the intercom. Oh, good. Yes, get some special effects in here. For Christ's sake, open the main lock. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. (laughs) Uh, Interior, airlock, day. Roby stumbles in as the inner door closes, and with a heavy whine, the thick surface door rumbles open. Orange sunlight billows in, followed by the inevitable dust. Standard hurls the carcass out, tongs and all. Yep, that happened to me when my housemate left uh, some meat on top of the fridge and it was rotten. Let's just, just oh. fucking toss that shit out. Yeah. <laughs> it had, ma- had maggots in it. Oh. <laughs> what would they do without their household butler android? I swear. <laughs> Probably shrivel up and die. <laughs> I know, I don't know how humans survive on their own. How did you survive? Millions of years without us. I, anyway. <laughs> uh, exterior, base of ship day. The parasite hits the ground and begins to sink into the dust, smouldering and fuming. Interior, airlock day. The outdoor, uh, the outer door rolls shut. Roby, slumping against the wall. My God, it's, it's lethal even when it's dead. Malconis gets down on his knees and studies the small burn holes in the floor. Standard opens the inner door and steps out into the corridor. There he activates the wall intercom and punches a, out a combination. Uh, interior corridor, outside airlock. Hunter, over intercom, filtered. Yes? Standard. How's Broussard? Hunter. He's running a fever. Standard. Still unconscious? Hunter. Yes. Can you do anything for him? The machine will bring his temperature down. His vital functions are strong. Good. He switches off the intercom. Standard. Suddenly exhausted. I need some coffee. He w- turns and walks away. The interior multi interior multi purpose room. The cat is sh- oh yeah, there's a cat here. Me. <laughs> the cat is strolling around as Roby and Malconis drop into the into seats. Uh, Standard draws a cup of coffee from the machine. I was just thinking, not to turn it too much, but in um, uh, Red Dwarf, do you think there's a cat on board as a reference to Alien? I never thought of it that way. Because he's a person, you know what I yeah. mean? He's, he's an evolved cat. Yeah, but, but he, I mean, he was originally on a ship as a, well, his ancestor uh, oh yeah, because it's like generations of cats. So, but originally there was a cat, much like <laughs> like this one. <laughs> a ship cat. That's very interesting. Ship cat. Yeah. I I, I don't know why you wouldn't want a ship dog. Just saying. <laughs> um, what was the other? Oh yeah, and then in Star Trek, Data has Spot. So ships and cats go together. Yeah, I guess so. And I guess that I guess with the symbolic ness of um dan's scripts he had a lot of like egyptian influences and cats being you know revered in egyptian mythology and being the ones to be able to walk between the spirit world and the human world you know having That's the true, cat yeah. in there was symbolic of that 
because it's then... to walk around and see the alien and see the humans but not really be part of what was going on. Yeah, and evoking that sort of the feel of a traditional uh, ship, mm. which often had cats catching mice and what have you. Mm. So the cat is strolling around as Roby and Malconis uh, drop it into seed standard, draws a cup of coffee from the machine. Malconis says, These day and night cycles are totally disorientating. I feel like we've been here for days, but it's only been how long? Roby, stroking the cat. About four hours. <laughs> <laughs> Standard, staring into his coffee cup. I'm sorry to say it, it looks like you were right in the first place, Martin. We never should have landed here. Roby replies, look, I'm not going to try to rub any, uh, anybody's nose in anything. The important thing is just to get away from here as fast as possible. Standard. I can't lean on Faust any harder. He's been working nonstop on the engines. When you're in the end, people, page 67. <laughs> Roby says, If we knew exactly what happened to the beings on the other ship, Malkona says, We do know that. Roby says, Yeah? Malkona says, They never made it off the planet. The, the parasites won. This brings a chilly silence. Roby replies, Where did the parasites come from? They seem native to the planet. It got, it's got an atmosphere and a dense gravity. It's dead now, but once it must have been fertile. I don't know if they knew that about Mars back then, but that's obviously the case with Mars, that it once had an atmosphere and may have once supported life. And then uh, the gravity, I think it was just because the gravity wasn't great enough to hold the atmosphere in place. Yeah, and I think you're right. They didn't have that sort of knowledge back then. But I think that Dan O'Bannon would have looked at this in a way that the parasites were kind of like a nuclear bomb. Like, it will mm. obliterate all life. So, in an essence, he originally thought of the alien as a weapon as well. Um, and yeah, if this was well, either the black goo or, or some kind of parasite or whatever, that uh, if it decimated the ecosystem enough, and it doesn't even have to... I mean, Obviously, destroying plants would have the most significant uh, change, but even removing a single animal from an ecosystem can have untold consequences, even on the atmosphere and the contents of it. It's interesting how they kind of changed the way the pathogen works, because originally um, in Prometheus, they had this viral media where they showed that the engineers had previously experimented on other planets eliminating mm. life and it showed that they had no life whatsoever but what david did when he dropped that pathogen on the city it killed the engineers but everything else was fine yeah so it's not something that's made to just destroy everything in its path it's it's targeted it's specialized or it prioritizes certain matter over other matter mm. yeah it killed the meat <laughs> So to speak. The meat, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, where's Mike to do his impression? He does good, David. Yeah. Oh, he'll be joining me on, on the next one, winding up this uh, this series. Hooray. <laughs> so it'll be good. Uh, so, yeah, and it'll, it'll be sad to not do this anymore, but what's really exciting, everyone... Well, there's is, always more scripts. There's always more scripts. Um, I've anonymously been sent some Ridley grams of the original Covenant 2 uh, draft. Where, oh, cool. Which is based on, on I think it was the, the prologue that we went through. Yeah. So if you want to join me for that. Yeah. Awesome. And we'll do an analysis of that. <laughs> I'd love to cover the Alien 3, the... Oh, Neuromancer, of bloody... Uh, William Gibson. William Gibson script. Strip. Yeah, we could do that next. <laughs> which is kind of topical now. It's being adapted into a comic. Yeah, that's right. And I believe they've already got the audio drama coming out. Oh, yeah, I mean, it'd be great, especially if someone wants to sort of compare what was in that original script and how they adapt it for both comic and and, and audio drama. Yeah, that'll be cool. Yeah, hmm. let's do it. <laughs> yes. Here, was, here I was thinking, oh, my God, I'm not going to find any more things to cover on Alien, but then here are you coming up with all these great ideas. Just fantastic. Oh, man, it never ends. <laughs> it's just, it, it, there is no limit to the minutia. <laughs> <laughs> for you and so, me, uh, yeah. every day is Alien Day. Every day. 
All right, so uh, up to um, Melconis, I believe. No, it's just too small to support fauna. As big as par- as sorry, uh, it's just too small to support fauna as big as the parasites. If there were a native ecology, it would have to be microscopic. Oh, like the moats and covenant. Hmm. <laughs> Roby says, couldn't the pyramid have been built here by space travelers? Standard. Too primitive. It's a pre-technological construction. That slab was engineered by an Iron Age culture at best. That's a hell of an estimate. <laughs> you know, I, I'm I'm a captain, just a captain, not an archaeologist. Haven't done any research, but uh, I'd say, yeah, Iron Iron Age. Everybody, everybody, yeah. And he was the one who made the guess that the space jockey was 150 years old in the script. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. I'm 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 still perturbed by the fact that they kind of let Dallas make these decisions. Like, does he have an uh, archaeologist background? Is he like some sort of paleontologist that he could make these assumptions scientifically? Yeah, this, this is dialogue just... doesn't really. I mean, yes, in real life, people can have very diverse backgrounds, and yeah, maybe he did study archaeology in his in his teens, and then he realized that wasn't for him, but. It, to, to streamline it and make characters a little bit more condensed and straightforward, this should be dialogue coming from a science officer or yeah, someone with some kind of connection to archaeology. Yeah, and all of these statements are very speculative at best. <laughs> yes. Maybe he's just trying to sound smart in front of his crew, you know? Maybe. Trying to don't feel let them like know, he's got something he's... to prove. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Melkona says, uh, they're from a dead civilization. They're spores from a tomb. God knows how long they've been here. Roby says, I think we'd better take another look at those uh, hieroglyphs. Suddenly the door opens and Faust sticks his head in. He is covered with dirt and grime. Faust, hey, it's what? Standard, what? Faust, the engines are fixed. Exterior, planetoid, day. The snark's engines cough, then with a roar begin to belch out streams of superheated air, cutting through the... Tology? That's a new word. Dust. The ship roars and vibrates like a huge beast capable of unlimited power. Unlimited power! You have to say it that way. (laughs) Exterior... (laughs) Bridge day. They are all at their posts. Who is they? Got to specify. Um, they're all at their posts. Standard. Switch on the tractor beams. Oh, they got tractor beams. This is Star Trek now. <laughs> uh, there is a hair tingling. It's, I was gonna tying that in with the um. Uh, what do you call it? the grappling hook? You know, this piece of technology that's become so ubiquitous in fiction that you almost just accept it as real, even though it, it's not. Um, tractor beams are definitely another one where you just you just expect that a ship has force fields, tractor beams, all that sort of stuff, even though that's pretty exclusive to Star Trek and maybe a little bit Star Wars as well. Um, I like that Prometheus really did away with all of that. It, they are just, you know, c- constructs made of metal floating in space. It makes it far more vulnerable that you don't have this almost magical technology there. Uh, even if the rules, like, like in Star Trek, so the rules are fairly well established of this is how a tractor beam works, this is how a transporter works. But then, oh, yeah, but a transporter can also work as like a, a like a, a, a decontamination thing. So when we reassemble the molecules, we just filter out the bad ones. Like, what the fuck? So... <laughs> Uh, that's a frustrating thing when, when you watch as much Star Trek as I have for the past couple of weeks. You just go, it's just ex machinas all the way down. It's just, <laughs> you, you need to save the day, just make up some bullshit. Apparently, tractor beams can do this now, or you reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. But um, Aliens isn't that. Aliens, you that's what makes it a really visceral horror, because you feel the reality of, shit, if you get trapped out here, that's it. Someone might find you, but probably not. You know, there aren't people on every planet along the way. 
you're in the middle of nowhere, uh, and that reality comes to life in turn, or for, for Ridley, uh, Ripley, specifically in both uh, Aliens and Alien Three. Even with something like a uh, a cryo chamber, it can go wrong, and it can really ruin your life. <laughs> That's true, and yeah, it's just. I guess it's in the title, uh, in space, no one can hear you scream. <laughs> yeah. I think you've got the ash scene going on in the background there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Bloody ash. <laughs> um, oh, I was just, I forgot to mention earlier that he's definitely an android who I actually don't think he has a lot of agency. I think he really is just. He's following he, company he, orders. Ash yeah, did he, nothing wrong. Everyone yes. hates Ash so much. Hashtag Ash did not. He is the good guy in all this, and, and I, I like the this point of view that Alex White has for the android Ash, is that he was just doing his job, and after he says, you know, uh, last thing, uh, I just want to say you have my sympathies, and he smiles, he genuinely means it. He doesn't want anything bad to happen to the humans. But you think you you think he was being sincere? Yeah, I think he was. I, I thought he was being a smug fucking asshole. Like you, you think he's being facetious? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Can an, he, an, he... can an android like Ash really be facetious? Yeah, I, he, I absolutely. He wasn't facetious in any other scene in, in the film. Because he's finally being himself, and he's sort of revealing. He, he becomes very David in that moment of, "Oops, sorry." <laughs> Poor choice of words. He just he goes very much into the zone of, you're going to die, but I'm going to be very polite about it. <laughs> I see we have different views on androids, <laughs> and that's perfectly fine. <laughs> see, I can do it. I can do it. <laughs> you can't trust anything they say. No, you can't. You really can't. Mm. <laughs> but I still maintain oh, Ash was just doing his job. Yeah, I do think. That we can agree on, that I think he definitely, if you just gave him different commands, like, look after the crew of the ship at all costs, he would do that. He isn't made with a soothing presence, personality like Walter. You know, Walter's very much, he's designed to sort of be a big teddy bear, you know. Um, he is the uh, Baymax of he, the alien universe. Yeah, he's, he's a bishop of the prequels. That's yeah. why they gave him the American accent, really easy going, like very softly spoken when he talks yeah. to people. <laughs> oh, I just want to cuddle up to him. He's just so lovely. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> whereas, yeah, with Ash, he's just, he's got, he's very cold. He, there was nothing during his design and development, no one was trying to make him appealing. And I mean, in a way, that makes him more human, that he's not trying to please anyone. I think an android generally is trying to please people uh, and is very outwardly focused where ash is very withdrawn and it's just the mission um, but i have to wonder yeah if you do give him more humane goals what does he become hmm. uh, because i don't yeah again we sort of we project and we anthropomorphize and we think oh well this is ash's personality this is who he is it can't be changed eh, really <laughs> <laughs> that's true um, oh, yes, there we are. Uh, there is a hair-tingling electrical hum which permeates the whole ship, and it begins to float like a cork in water. Standard. Like those tractor beams, the pitch of the hum changes, and the ship levels itself. Standard. Retract the landing struts. Exterior. Ship. Day. The ship is hovering above the ground on beams of shimmering force. The landing struts uh, fold up under the belly of the ship. Interior, bridge, day. Standard. Take us up. <laughs> and let me just get my voice changer, Roby, into the intercom. Up one kilometre, Jay. Exterior, planetoid, planetoid, day. The snark begins to levitate up into the sky onto the beams of light. Interior, bridge, day, standard. Switch on lifter, squad, lifter quads, powerful, deep throbbing begins. The ship vibrates. 
exterior, snark, day. The hovering snark begins to accelerate through the choking atmosphere. Interior, bridge, day, standard. Engage artificial gravity. Roby throws a switch and the ship lurches. Roby says, engaged. Engaged. <laughs> standard. <laughs> let's take her... Um, Let's take her into an escape orbit. Men get busy with switches. Roby says, I'm altering our vector now. She'd give us an easy escape velocity. A huge tremor runs through the ship. Should we leave it there? Uh, no, we will finish on 70. Okay. Roby and Malconis in concert. Ooh. <laughs> What was that? Yeah, try doing two voices at once. Oh, actually, I think I can. Hold on. What was that? I, I, I it didn't, it didn't work. <laughs> it worked on their end. <laughs> They'd be on oh, their okay. End. <laughs> All right. So post production sort of. Oh yeah. Because like I can hear for the audience's benefit, I can hear the intercom effect. But yes. Um, in answer, the communicator beeps. Communicators again, bit Star Trek. And a pass, and a pass line. Uh, over, filtered. This stuff is getting clogged in the intakes again. Standard. Just hold us together till we're in space, that's all. The pitch of the engines changes, deepens. Exterior, sky, day. The snark swoops up at an acute angle into the boiling clouds. Visibility is zero. Interior, engine room. Faust is pulling on a gas mask because the engine chamber is beginning to fill with dust. He turns on a huge exhaust unit, which begins to suck up some of the dust. They act like this dust isn't really that bad. It's like, oh, it's fine dust and it's getting stuck in it. No, uh, as I've talked about on, uh, on my Prometheus by Minute podcast, the dust on Mars will kill you. It is poisonous and it cannot be removed. It's like sandpaper to your lungs it will just cut you up on the inside it's this really nasty stuff and it's a huge issue with um plans to colonize mars it's like how do we deal with this stuff so it's yeah it's not like i don't know like a dusty work site might be close yeah. to what something is like mining but yeah on mars it's pretty much like microscopic glass <laughs> if you could imagine that getting into your lungs yep mm. <laughs> Uh, I can almost remember the word peculator. Pe 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 I don't know. Uh, there's a name for the particular dust, but doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I'm forgetting words left and right and center today. <laughs> You'll have to tell uh, me later so we can put it into the blog. <laughs> yes. Uh, interior, bridge, day. On the screens, nothing but clouds. Then another tremor shudders the ship. The men no longer speak. Their expressions are grim, set, and sweating. They are watching their instruments. Periodically, they mutter technical instructions to each other. Exterior, ship, day. Abruptly, the ship clears the top of the cloud layer and bursts out into the star-sprinkled spring space, trailing a, uh, trailing a wake of dust behind them. Interior, bridge, out of space. They all cheer. Hooray! <laughs> all right. So that is up to 71 and pretty much after that there is it, it goes for a, a couple more chapters but um, I think I'm doing another 20 pages with um, Michael Skidderi who is yes. uh, Ash from a fan fiction comic but yeah perhaps after that will you rejoin me for I think is it page 92 it goes actually to 124 so there's a couple of like chapters after yeah um, but yeah let's uh let's do that so I'll, I'll have mike on for the next one if he's available um and then i'll bring i'll bring connor back for uh, yeah. the yeah. last few chapters but yeah i thought that was really good uh we kind of got to meet the the little uh tentacle uh face hugger thing which was is, is essentially the trilobite um and we got to kind of yeah that's true yeah yeah, kind of see what the crew reacted like when interacting with uh, this alien octopus. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, keep seeing myself on the stream, and I just keep seeing my brother. It's <laughs> <laughs> really. Yeah, we were very similar faces. Um, he's probably got a bit of a longer face than mine, but um, 
yeah, and then we move our mouth the same way. We don't even have the same accent, I don't think. Or we don't we don't sound the same at all. But uh, yeah, so we move our mouth so the same. Weird. What the hell? That's so weird. <laughs> <sighs> so yeah, how exciting. Uh, we've got so much to go through. It being the 40th anniversary of Alien this year, we've got the Alien script, then we're going back to, to Covenant with um, the Ridley Grams, but then obviously we'll, we'll go off and um, speak about uh, Resurrection and Alien 3 and all of these amazing other things. So yeah, everyone stay tuned. <laughs> Plenty more to come. Uh, doing my plugs. Uh... We have Prometheus by Minute is my my main project. Uh, it's been a while. I haven't actually edited the one you and I did together. Uh, I've just I've been trying to get my costumes done for Supernova. It's, it's coming soon. Got like a month, but uh, yeah, might finish my Connor from Detroit. Not me. Um, my Connor RK800 jacket uh, in the next week or so. And then I'll try and get back to a regular schedule schedule with Prometheus by Minute. And uh, I have another podcast called Saint Elsewhere where we review the uh, depictions of autistic characters or just autism in the media. And the next one we're doing is Mr. Darcy from Pride and Prejudice, which will be a two-parter. Oh, really? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> a lot of people were surprised. I was like, oh, I didn't think of that. I, was like, I didn't either. And then I watched it, the BBC one, which is very good, by the way. Uh, that's why it's a two-parter, because it's a mini-series of six episodes. And, yeah, um, he is very, he's acting very autistic. So that, that's going to be fun to delve into. Wow, and I never watched it with that sort of mindset. I'm going to have to rewatch it. See, this is why we do our show, because, yeah, there are so many things even we've watched where we didn't think about it, and then my co-host, Hector, will go, oh, we should review this, and I'm going, why? Because of this character. I'm, oh! Bro- <laughs> yeah, I did. Especially when you grow up and, and you're not diagnosed, you aren't looking at it through that lens. Mm. And now that and I now think I about it, Darcy isn't an asshole. He's just a hell of an autistic <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's a stickler for rules. He has a very rigid sense of how things should be done and routine. And he's very bad at expressing himself. And he sees, you know, social conventions as sort of ridiculous. And he doesn't get the, the importance of them and stuff like that. And he doesn't uh, like dancing. <laughs> doesn't like dancing. I like dancing. So. <laughs> I guess it depends. Um, but like all, all of the autistic people that I know don't like dancing like at all. Because <laughs> for me, it's stimming. It's socially acceptable stimming. It's great. <laughs> stimming right in front of you. Don't know. Hide my autism. Right. Yeah, can't see me. Um, Fantastic. Uh, uh, what other projects? Uh, I probably won't be participating in Mermaid. Uh, Mermaid is this drawing thing where you draw one mermaid every day for May. Uh, I did <laughs> one last year. Uh, yeah, I just I don't have the energy for drawing. Yeah, I'll come back eventually. I think that's about it. Uh, also, uh, I am on Instagram, uh, Connor Coulson Prime. You can see all my cooking and fashion and costumes and, and what have you. Oh, uh, yeah. Get onto that jacket of mine. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, the pattern's all cut out. I'm just sort of fiddling with that. I think it, it, it's pretty much just because um, the pattern, it's a very low armhole. So I just sort of cut across here, raise that up. There you go. I've got all. I also bought the uh, the patch, and the piping. So, cool. Yeah. Do you? Ha, if you could have a twirl ready for when I'm in Perth in November. Oh. You come in for that, a fitting. Yes, that would actually be much better if I can actually fit it on you because <laughs> I am a perfectionist and I'm just going. I've measured this ninety times, and this this should be okay. But I, I would like to fit it. But yeah, um, yeah. That, I'll make that some time to see you in between my. Uh, my sister-in-law's uh, wedding and uh, traveling to Perth because I'm only going to be there for that weekend. So I'm pretty much going to go straight from the airport and say, bye, husband, I'm going to go see Connor. Yes. <laughs> He's going to measure me up. <laughs> and I'm pretty central to the city, so it's pretty, pretty easy. Excellent, excellent. Uh, for those who uh, don't know, I am on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Reddit, uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, Podbean, WordPress, I could go on. We're on everywhere. Oh, 
<laughs> you can just ask, but I'm, I'm mainly on Twitter. If you want to interact with me, you can just tag me with the at symbol uh, or on my posts on um, Instagram as well. <laughs> so um, um, I've got a couple of shows to record coming up. I've got to do a review of the 4K uh, remastered Alien film. Uh, with um, I'm reviewing that with Dominic Hailstone and I just got to find the time because he's in the UK I'm here it's just hard to find the time that we both can sync up um, and then we've also got a couple of different interviews that are, are really overdue we're just waiting for people to get back to us um, we've got a, interviewing a couple of the directors from the shorts we're I've going to be interviewing uh, Mira Grant who wrote Alien Echo so if you have any questions for that novel just uh send them to me and um we've also got an overdue <laughs> interview from um, Lorelai King who plays mother um, and she's obviously been busy doing the voice of mother in um the William Gibson's uh audio drama because she's oh, that's that. cool. so that's because of all these delays I'm really sorry people I'm not on onto it <laughs> Mm. Uh, but we'll get around to all of that stuff soon. So thank you for joining um, me and Connor for this very long <laughs> analysis with a lot of tangents, but there's been a lot of fun. Uh, thank it was you. about, what, 90 minutes? It's, it's, it's reasonable. And, and, and we're kind of like trying out uh, Connor's new uh, Yutani nickname. Uh, syntax, yes, I believe. Syntax, which was my, uh, I used that when I was part of a Tron Legacy uh, roleplay game. That was <laughs> that was the name of my program, and uh, yeah, I, I I think it's really cool that I'm bringing it back. <laughs> and the only thing I can think of when I see syntax is syntax error. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's very. I think it's very alien appropriate too. It's just sort of futuristic cyberpunk sort of thing. Yeah. Um, there's a really good band called Syntax. They only ever released one album, I think, and then a few random tracks here and there of the years. But Syntax, check them out. It's good stuff. Awesome. All right. So uh, this is Mother 9000, uh, second last survivor of this live cast, signing off. <laughs> this is Connor making a Syntax signing off. The, 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 the final survivor? <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, peeps. Catch you later. Mother, how long? Yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. Remember to like, share or support Studio Yutani on Patreon and subscribe to yutani.studio to stay up to date. Transmission complete. This is Mother 9000. Signing off. <laughs>